All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started, um, beginning as always in prayer. Um, and I will go again with the opening prayer that um, St. Augustine had um, at the beginning that we saw last week. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Great are you, O Lord, and exceedingly worthy of praise. Your power is immense and your wisdom beyond reckoning. And so we humans, who are a due part of your creation, long to praise you. We who carry our mortality about with us, carry the evidence of our sin, and with it the proof that you thwart the proud. Yet these humans, due part of your creation as they are, still do long to praise you. You stir us so that praising you may bring us joy, because you have made us and drawn us to yourself, and our heart is unquiet until it rests in you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, uh, so tonight um, <clears throat> we have books three and four. We're going to follow basically the same um, schedule that we had last week, about 25 minutes um, for half of each book with five minute um, question periods between. Um, I'm going to go ahead and begin with some questions that I received over the week. Um, and just a couple comments, I had things that I wanted to be clear about what I said in the last lecture. Um, <clears throat> so one of the questions that we had last time um, was about Augustine's comment in um, book one, paragraph 19, where he says, no one is doing right who has, acts unwillingly, even if what he does is good in itself. And then the question was, is this how he views all actions in moral theology? And is this the overall consensus of the church? Um, so I kind of, no, I didn't kind of, I absolutely avoided this question last time um, as I'm a literary scholar, not a theologian. I wanted to actually talk with theologians before I gave an answer to a question about moral theology. Um, and the answer is basically, it depends. The situation Augustine has described here is so incredibly vague. Um, exactly what kind of acting unwillingly, I mean, that could be anything from being forced at gunpoint to do something to being forced by some kind of compulsion that one barely has control over. Um, and the action that one is talking about um, so that describes so many situations, it's impossible to give a single answer that would be true in every case. Um, a significant thing to look at in this is the question of performing good works, um, which are good works performed whether you wanted to do them or not, um, and something that is meritorious, something that earns merit for our own souls, which if you aren't, if what you're doing, you're not doing willingly, um, it's very hard to have to gain merit um, for your action. Um, so this time I'm gonna mostly sidestep the question um, again, but because it's so wide open. Um, and then in chapter two, paragraph 10, where St. Augustine says, not yet am I in hell after all, but even if I were, you would be there too. For if I descend to the underworld, you are there. Um, the question was, does this mean that God is still with souls in hell? Um, not in any meaningful sense. The definition of hell theologically is that it's separation from God. So the, the way that we would say that God is in hell is that hell is a part of creation. Um, this is something that Dante understands very well. The, those famous lines over the gate of hell in Dante's Inferno, um, Justitia mosse mi alto fattore, fecimi la divin podestate la somma sapienza il primo amore. Justice moved my high maker. Um, divine power made me. Highest wisdom and the first love. Um, so hell is um, a creation that is to a certain extent a necessary part um, of humanity's creation with free will. Um, to have free will means to be given the opportunity to reject God. So although hell, and I guess this is sort of the point, um, being in hell is not an escape from God. Um, hell itself is part of creation and the reality of hell is, is completely, it, it's not as though it's outside of God. Um, so in that sense, it's not, 
it's not as though God is there with the souls in hell comforting them in any way. Um, but it is in a larger sense that nothing in creation by definition can be outside of God. That's what Don, well, that's what Augustine is looking at there. Um, and then a question about, um, I talked about marriage and the um, sociological reality in ancient Rome, where so many um, infant girls were simply killed because they weren't wanted. So as a result, Roman society had a ratio of male to female of about three to two. Um, and that's the reason why it's so common in the stories that we have, that you have a female Christian and a male pagan coming together in marriage is because comparatively, there were more women in Christian society than in pagan society. Um, so the question was um, about Augustine's wife, his parents' attitude towards him, and whether she was Catholic. Um, so to make a division here, there is Augustine's concubine, who we'll talk about today, this woman that he lived with as a common law wife for 14 years. Um, he respected her. He loved her very deeply. Um, but she was not, um, they weren't married within the church. Um, it appears that St. Monica allowed this woman in their home. St. Monica loved the child that Augustine had with the concubine. Um, and the child loved St. Monica as well. When the concubine eventually was dismissed, when Augustine moves to Milan in 385, um, St. Monica is able to set up a marriage for him um, with a rich heiress, probably Christian, but we don't know for sure. Um, but when this marriage was then set up, at that point in time, Augustine had to um, send the concubine home, basically. Um, and it's a heartbreaking scene. And the concubine vowed that she would never, um, that after this, she would treat herself as though she was a widow. She would not find comfort with any man afterwards. So it's possible that she was Christian. The biographers aren't entirely sure. We don't know fully. Um, and talking about Monica from last time, um, I brought up Augustine's criticisms of St. Monica. Um, I just wanna make sure that that's not taken in the sense of Monica wasn't really looking out for Augustine, Monica was being selfish or anything along those lines. Um, I'm not at all suggesting that. Um, what we see here is that Augustine, who is very open with his own human flaws is also opening us up to Monica's very human flaws. Um, she wanted the best for Augustine always. However, being human means that wanting the best for somebody inevitably means at some point in time you're going to fail and they will be hurt. Um, we can say in retrospect that if Monica had done what Augustine wanted and allowed him to marry when he was 16, we probably wouldn't be reading about him today. Um, the way that Augustine Augustine, as we know him, is shaped by these experiences. Um, so the incredible spiritual impact that Augustine has had for 1600 years is to a certain extent also due to Monica's frailty, um, that she wanted the best for him. This hurt Augustine. He still didn't understand it as he's writing this at the age of 40. Um, but I certainly hope that nobody came away thinking that I was criticizing St. Monica for being selfish. I absolutely was not. Um, and on the question of schooling, um, you know, schooling in the Roman world, the significance of it is just very different than what we have today. Um, I compared it to what goes on in America with the pressure to succeed, um, but the stakes in American schooling are nowhere near as high as they would have been in Augustine's day. Um, and you know, providentially, I was reading a book last week um, that had just an outstanding parallel to this. Um, and the book was um, Immaculate Iliba Jesus, and forgive me for butchering her name, um, book on Our Lady of Kibeho. Um, Immaculate was one of those who, she, she wasn't a visionary at the, at the apparitions of Our Lady of Kibeho in Rwanda in 1981, um, but she was familiar with them. When she was 11, um, her father went and told her all of the stories about that. And, when Immaculate is giving us this story about the apparitions that occurred at the school in Rwanda, she's talking about the significance of schooling in Rwanda, that for the girls who went to this school, 
if they graduated from the school and they got a degree, there was the possibility for them to have actual jobs. But in that society at that time for those girls, if they did not get the high school degree, um, any kind of work outside of being a midwife was basically impossible for them. Um, and basically one of the miracles of Our Lady of Kibeho is that all of the girls that participated in um, saying the rosary with the visionaries actually did graduate, which um, Immaculate says was just unheard of there. Um, so the Roman world is similar to that. If Augustine does well in schools, he has all of these incredible opportunities, but they're kind of in a provincial backwaters. And if Augustine does not have access to education in the world that opens up, um, any kind of life outside of doing manual labor is pretty much unimaginable for him. So St. Monica is absolutely acting with his best interests at heart. And the Augustine that we know and love is due to her actions. Okay, and then finally, the last thing, a question on um, the numbering. Um, last week, I had set up the numbering with the book numbers and then the chapter numbers and then the paragraph numbers. Um, the books, and this is, um, a separate, a different edition of the translation that you have. The translation that you have gives chapter numbers once with each chapter, but then it only gives the paragraph numbers over here. So the smaller number he here, this is the chapter number that corresponds to like chapter five in the edition that you have. The larger number next to it right here, this is the paragraph number that corresponds to the running paragraph numbers in your text. So as you're matching up what I'm reading on the screen with the edition that you have, um, if you have the, um, the Maconi, the Black St. Ignatius critical editions um, edition, this second number here, the larger one, um, that is the one that lines up with it. Okay, and with that, we will go ahead and get started. So book three, um, Augustine's now describing his student years in Carthage. Um, his father, Patricius, was able to save up enough money to send him to Carthage, which was by far the most important city in um, North Africa, probably the second most important city in Outside of, outside of Constantinople at the time. Um, in these years, even Rome is seriously declining in influence. Um, the emperor is no longer at Rome, the emperor is in Milan. Carthage is the most important city nearby, one of the top three cities in the empire. So for his father to be able to send him there is, um, you know, it's a sign of, of just the incredible savings that his father did, but it also marks Augustine um, as sort of being fast-tracked educationally. Um, but if we remember what was going on at the end of book two, um, Augustine is being sent off to the great university town as he's unable to control his sexual desires as a teenager. Um, so paragraph one, so I arrived at Carthage where the din of scandalous love affairs raged cauldron-like around me. I was not yet in love, but I was enamored with the idea of love. And so deep within me was my need that I hated myself for the sluggishness of my desires. In love with loving, I was casting about for something to love. The security of a way of life free from pitfalls seemed abhorrent to me because I was inwardly starved of that food, which is yourself, O oh God. Um, so the description that Augustine gives here is one that resounds throughout the age. I mean, this is the adolescent um, hormonal experience that Augustine is de delivering. Um, he just describes it so much better, in love with loving. Um, and he makes that, by phrasing it this way, he makes it very clear that at this point in time, um, his sexual endeavors here have nothing to do with intimacy with um, the girls that he's with. It's this notion that he has of giving himself over to his impulses in love with loving 
I was casting about for something to love. He loves the idea of loving, but the actual experience of love is one that he is not finding in the lifestyle that he's living. Um, I had no desire for food that does not perish, that is God, not because I had my fill of it, but because the more empty I was, the more I turned from it in revulsion. Um, and that experience everybody can relate to of struggling with any kind of vice and rejecting the one solution to all of that, which is to turn to God with one's whole heart, mind, and soul. Loving and being loved were sweet to me, the more so if I could also enjoy a lover's body. So I polluted the stream of friendship with my filthy desires and clouded its purity with hellish lusts. Yet all the while, befouled and disgraced though I was, my boundless vanity made me long to appear elegant and sophisticated. I can't remember the theologian who said, um, it was a medieval theologian who pointed out that um, lust is so terrible as it is um, because it thwarts specifically the proud. Um, those who would seem to have everything in their life so perfectly lined up, but can't control their own desires. And that's Augustine here. Um, all he wants to do is to prepare as though he's to appear as though he's succeeding in this world, this secular world. But by no means is he that his inner life is just an absolute shambles, but he wants to appear elegant and sophisticated on the outside. Um, and this is where he picks up his concubine and we'll come up to her in a second. Um, although we'll notice here that he's sort of referring to, he says, I polluted the streams of friendship with my filthy desires and clouded its purity with hellish lusts. Um, and he's referring in advance to the concubine that he takes and referring to her as a friend at all is absolutely remarkable. Um, in the Roman world, the idea that that women could be involved in friendship was just something that made no sense to them. Um, in the Greco-Roman world, the idea of friendship, the love of virtue in another person was understood, almost defined as something that could only exist between men. And then Augustine turns here, and if, if you're reading this on your own and you're trying to figure out exactly what's going on, um, he then talks about the theater. Um, I was held, spell, held spellbound by theatrical shows full of images that mirrored my own wretched plight and further fueled the fire within me. Why is it that one likes being moved to grief at the sight of sad or tragic events on the stage when one would be unwilling to suffer the same thing oneself? In the capacity of spectator, one welcomes sad feelings. In fact, the sadness itself is the pleasure. Um, and to hear he's, he's coming very close to his own theory of theater, which um, is almost identical to what um, Aristotle would eventually come up or previously had come up with um, the notion of catharsis, that release in the audience. But what Augustine notices here is his reason for doing this, um, because his life is in shambles. Um, he sees something on stage that he wants to relate to. He wants, we talked about um, being in love with one's own ruin. And Augustine's love of the theater is the complement to that. Um, that what he sees in the tragedies that are being performed um, in a way validate his own feelings. Misery that you would never want for yourself, but as a theater show, he's able to find some place for. Um, and the question here that um, we need to hold on to is the idea of mercy that pops up here. Um, although his state of mind is usually called misery when he is undergoing them, things that happen in theater, um, and when he's undergoing them himself, and mercy when he shows compassion for others so afflicted. But how is re how real is the mercy evoked by fictional dramas? So when Augustine is feeling bad for the people who are suffering on stage, and he loves that feeling, he loves the feeling of having pity for those on stage. But as he notices here, it's a mercy that is so hollow. He's not merciful for himself. He's not feeling sorrow at the state of his own corruption. Um, instead, he's finding something, he's finding a world of make-believe, and he's addressing all of his mercy to those actors up on the stage. 
Um, and in the next book, um, he'll actually experience a tragedy in real life. Um, and his real life experience of tragedy, not his own inner tragedy that he can't recognize at this point, but an external tragedy brings about um, this question of mercy and suffering, joined suffering, um, that takes it from the stage into real life. Um, and then when you read this on your own, that's what's going on here in paragraphs. Um, three, four, and five, that question of the theater and mercy is everything that is happening in his life or was happening in his life that as he remembers, he had no way of processing. He had no way of sort of analyzing himself of trying to fix himself. Um, it's only in retrospect that he can see what's wrong with him. In the moment, he has no idea at all. Um, and so the theater ends up being a form of escapism for him. Um, escapism because it allows him, and we use that term escapism all the time without really getting into the psychology of it, but Augustine understands perfectly what that psychology is. The experience of feeling good about feeling merciful towards other people um, allows him to feel good about himself without fixing any of the problems that require this emotional outpouring. And then there's this group here in paragraph six, the wreckers. The Latin word there is eversores, um, which it doesn't, like to say wreckers is kind of true, but eversores would be the term that would be applied to people that would come in when a city was sacked by an opposing army um, and there was the looting, pillaging, raping, and rioting that occurred for three days after the fall of the city. The people who took advantage of that to live absolutely lawlessly. Um, the Latin term for that is eversores. So this group of students that he follows into here, and, and we'll notice that this occurs, the prestigious course of studies I was following looked at, it's called the law courts, in which I was destined to excel and where I would earn a reputation all the higher in the measure that my performance was the more unscrupulous. So it's in this incredibly elite school that he runs into a group of people while they're all basically studying law together that live absolutely lawlessly, that um, turn their life in to this depraved show that is has a bit of theater to it. Um, and that Augustine, as he did when he was at home in Fagust, um, he's almost embarrassed not to be able to live up to their expectations for just how um, dissipated his life should be. And a line that he has about the mirror, those lines that still ring true across the centuries, they would chase sensitive freshmen relentlessly, taunting and hounding them on no provocation, simply for their own malicious amusement. Nothing is more like demonic activity than this behavior. What after name could be found for such people than wreckers? And eversores in Latin literally means to overturn. Um, they first wrecked and twisted themselves. So they turned them, they overturned their own, um, their own souls, essentially. Then the spirits who secretly seduce and deceive them laugh to see them deceiving and laughing at other people. Um, and so this is the first part of Augustine's time in Carthage, um, the part um, that doesn't work for him. But then the part that does, um, Cicero's Hortensius. He's reading Cicero, who, Cicero is one of the authors that's always been studied. Um, if, if you took Latin in high school or college, I can almost guarantee Cicero was probably a third of the translations that you did. Um, his Latin has just sort of been seen as the standard for eloquent classical Latin um, for 2000 years now. So Augustine picks up Cicero's, um, and this is a lost work, the Hortensius here. Um, we only know about it because of the way Augustine cites it. This ends up being this scene here, um, almost a preview of what's going to happen to him in Milan. He picks up Cicero because he wants to learn how to be effective with his rhetoric, because that's the whole world that Augustine's going into, is um, the, world of, the world of oratory, the world of giving speeches, the world of convincing people to your side, to your point of view, whether or not that point of view is right or wrong. Um, but as he's reading Cicero here, 
um, and he's reading the Hortentius. He comes across an exhortation to philosophy. The book changed my way of feeling and the character of my prayers to you, O oh Lord, paragraph seven. For under its influence, my petitions and desires were altered. All my hollow hopes suddenly seemed worthless. And with unbelievable intensity, my heart burned with longing for the immortality that wisdom seemed to promise. I began to rise up in order to return to you. My interest in the book was not aroused by its usefulness in the honing of my verbal skills, which was supposed to be the object of studies I was now pursuing. No, it was not merely as an instrument for sharpening my tongue that I used this book, for it had won me over not by its style, but by what it had to say. This moment here for Augustus is life altering because in all of his course of studies up to this moment, the idea that there should be truth or substance to what is being said and what is being discussed simply did not exist. In the world of rhetoric, all that matters is convincing your audience what you want to convince them of. Um, if you can imagine basically just a marketing class in togas, that's pretty much um, Roman rhetoric schools. But with the discovery of Cicero, um, he comes across something that he had not seen before. And this is something that will change the rest of his life. He can't see it quite yet, but he's woken up to the idea that there is a truth to be sought after and that there is something that is wisdom, not just the ability to convince people of your point of view, but wisdom that exists independently of you that you can go after. Um, and so this is one of those seminal moments that starts putting him on the track towards God, simply for suggesting that there is truth out there. Um, and I think, okay, so it's 655. Um, I had originally planned to go a little farther before our break, but because I spent 10 minutes on the intro going over things, we're gonna take our break right now. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those questions. Um, the easiest way is to type them into chat um, or if you I think there's a little button where you can raise your hand um, or unmute yourself. Oh, okay. So a question here. Is there any evidence to suggest that he kept a journal or diary during these school years? Um, no. Um, it's not particularly likely that he would have. Um, off the top of my head, um, I'm not familiar with anything that suggests that he was in the habit of sort of recording daily thoughts. Um, the whole notion of taking a diary is very unusual um, before, oh, about si 16 or 1700. Before that, um, diaries are very uncommon. Um, for Augustine, um, especially given the lifestyle that he has described when he was a student, um, 
I can't imagine him keeping a diary at all. Um, you know, as he's going back and forth between lessons that are just about how do I use words better than everybody else and how do I beat them in competitions? And then how do I immediately go to a debauched lifestyle with my debauched buddies? Not a whole lot of time for keeping journals or interest in keeping journals in that environment. Um, so no diary, where does this come from? It's, it's coming from memory. Um, the question of how accurate is his memory? My guess would be it's extremely accurate. Um, one of the things, of, I mean, Augustine is very clearly literate, but the literacy in the Roman world is not like literacy in our world. Writing is very time consuming. Um, and as soon as, it, when Augustine was a bishop, he never physically wrote anything after that. Um, he always had a secretary to do the writing for him. Um, if you're familiar with St. Paul's letters, I'm trying to remember, I can't remember which one, um, but at the very end, it, he says, you know, see these large letters that I myself am writing. Um, because at that point in time, the letter was so important that Paul stopped having dictating it to somebody else and he actually wrote it down himself. Um, so just the time consuming nature of writing in this age um, doesn't really lend itself to that kind of um, discourse. And then who took care of his mother when his father died? Um, so it, it would appear that there was a fair amount, enough money for his mother to be able to survive on her own. Um, and her father, I believe was still alive. Um, they had, a, you know, there was enough of an established family that um, she wasn't like cast out on the street or anything. Um, and what form of Christianity did Monica have? So um, Augustine and Monica are Catholics. In North Africa at this time, the major, um, the major heresy at the time is Arianism. Um, Arianism is very common in Italy. It's very common in France and Spain. Um, the barbarian tribes, um, the gods, the vandals, as they came into the Roman Empire, they picked up Christianity, but the barbarian tribes usually picked up Arianism, um, the idea that Jesus Christ is not fully God, that um, the Son is not the equal of the Father. Um, and Augustine will run into that in Milan. Um, but there, at this point in time, there was hardly any of that in North Africa. Later on, there would be. Um, and in Augustine's life as bishop later on, Arianism becomes incredibly important because the barbarian tribe that sacks North Africa, that Augustine dies while the Vandals are laying siege to the city of Carthage. Um, and the Vandals were Arians and um, they used that to turn their pillaging into a pretend religious war. Um, but Monica is, um, is Catholic. Okay, with that, um, we'll move on to part two. The distaste that Augustine has for scripture. Um, so paragraph nine here. Um, after Augustine is set on fire with a desire for wisdom from reading Cicero, um, and he discovers philosophy. Um, you know, wisdom resides with you, but love for wisdom is called by the Greek name philosophy. It might seem odd to us that a student who's as brilliant as Augustine doesn't come across philosophy until he's an advanced high school and he basically stumbles across it by mistake. Um, but philosophy was not particularly important to the Romans, um, and it was not part of their central schooling system. Um, they did, you know, the seven liberal arts that we'll talk about here just in a minute, um, but grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Um, that's what all of Augustine's early education would have been, and mostly grammar and rhetoric, not a whole lot of logic. Um, so he comes across something, and, he, and this whole new world opens up to him, basically. Um, that there actually is substance to learning here, that learning is more than about picking up a few tricks to make money with. Um, and at this point in time, he then turns to his mother's 
scriptures, the Bible. Accordingly, I turned my attention to the Holy Scriptures to find out what they were like. What I see in them today is not something accessible to the scrutiny of the proud, nor exposed to the gaze of the immature. Something lowly as one enters, but lofty as one advances further. Something veiled in mystery. At that time, though I was in no state to enter, nor prepared to bow my head to accommodate myself to its ways, my approach then was quite different from the one I am suggesting now. When I studied the Bible and compared it with Cicero's dignified prose, it seemed to me unworthy. This is a huge issue. Um, for anybody who has studied patristics, um, the early church fathers, a major, major question for all of them um, up, up until the fall of Rome is the relationship between classical learning and scriptures. Um, because the two are written in such a completely different way. Um, Cicero, the way that he writes, it's beautiful, it's eloquent, it's set up with this elaborate prose style. Um, it follows what are called the classical conventions of style. In the Greco-Roman world, there was a clean cut description, or a clean cut distinction between um, the genres that you had elevated writing that dealt with what they considered to be important things, um, politics, war. And that was the lofty style that used a, a, a restricted vocabulary of very proper words. Um, and it had a restricted cast of characters. If you read, um, if you read the Odyssey, if you read the Iliad, um, it's tending in this direction. But by the time you get into um, classical Greek literature and Roman literature, it's all over the place, that in proper stories, you have people who are proper heroes, the nobility, soldiers, people fighting for their countries, and those are the things. Love is something that is very much kept to the side. The only real example of love in the Aeneid is between Aeneas and Dido, and that's what Augustine had talked about um, in book one. And that was seen as an example of Aeneas is a bad hero because he's stopping to fall in love rather than going to Italy and founding the Latin state the way that he should. So that's the lofty style. Then you had comedy where you could describe sort of the everyday events of life. You could have everyday characters. You could have women, slaves, merchants, all of these characters who were not allowed in the lofty style. Um, but the whole point of comedy is that it was not taken seriously. Um, and there's no way of confusing anything written in Greek or Latin. Um, you can't confuse which style it's written. It's just so immediately obvious. And then you go to the Bible, which is just completely different, especially the Gospels. You have the greatest story ever. You have God incarnate as man living on earth, teaching his wayward people how they are to live, and then sacrificing himself for their good. It's a story that to the classical mind makes no sense whatsoever. And when pagans criticized Christianity, this was usually what they criticized it on. The idea that God should come down and be incarnate and be born of a woman and lie in a manger and actually go through childbirth. That was something so abhorrent to them that pagan authors couldn't even describe it, um, much less imagine that this should appear in a book. So if you have the classical sense of what is a appropriate for literature. Um, the Bible is something that makes no sense um, simply because you have the greatest story ever told, but the cast of characters are absurd. Rather than having great kings and warriors in the Gospels, you have the son of a carpenter, you have his buddies who are fishermen, um, you have prostitutes, you have tax collectors, and they come in, but they talk about the most important things that there are, and it's has the greatest theme that there is. And it's just something that the Roman world of rhetoric um, could not handle at all. And the language of the Bible, um, Jerome's translation, St. Jerome's translation of the Bible in the Latin is known as the Vulgate um, because he translated it into the lingua vulgaris, the common tongue, um, as opposed to the proper tongue of literature. And all of the great fathers of the fourth century, all of them had this proper um, education. Um, Jerome, Augustine, Ambrose. Um, 
So they all had, had been reading these stories in Latin texts with these ideas about what literature is supposed to be. And then you look at the language of the gospels and the language is just so low that you can't imagine a good story coming out of that, much less the only story that really matters. Um, and that, so that's why you have um, St. Jerome with that dream that he tells us about where he dies um, and he's going up to the pearly gates and he's not allowed in. Um, and Christ tells him, you're not a Christian, you're a Ciceronian, because Jerome had such a love of that classical style that he wanted Cicero, and the Gospels just didn't live up to that. Um, so that's what Augustine's talking about here, is he's reading the scriptures, and he's just immediately dismissing them, because on the surface, it's this common language of this rabble that are not the sort of people that should be the heroes to this kind of a story. Um, and now as Augustine's writing this, um, you know, so this is when Augustine's reading this in like 376. Then in 397, when he's writing Confessions, he's looking back on this though. Um, and he's saying that basically the problem is that he was so puffed up on pride. His vanity was so absurd that he just immediately rejected scriptures without even trying to understand it. Um, and so a major moment for Augustine is going to happen when he's in Milan and he understands how do you actually approach the scriptures? How do you read the scriptures themselves? And then we have this fantastic line, scripture is a reality that grows along with little children, but I disdained to be a little child and in my high and mighty arrogance regarded myself as grown up. And so since he wouldn't be a child, he wouldn't have that simplicity to accept the gospels, what does he do? Um, so he joins a cult, basically. He joins the Manichees. Um, so the Manichees, um, you know, it's a major moment in Augustine's life. They were, it was a very young religion. Um, the prophet Manny had lived in the early part of the third century. So by Augustine's time, it's only been around for about a hundred years. Um, and Manny was, um, his religion was syncretic. That is, it's sort of, it's based kind of on Gnostic Christianity. Um, the Christianity that is roundly rejected by the fathers, um, the kind of Christianity that's very popular in terrible, uneducated American culture today, the, the Christianity that shows up in um, Dan Brown, um, in you know, the Da Vinci Code, that Gnostic Christianity of this secret wisdom. Um, for the people that read the gospel and saw it as just far too plain, one of the responses was to assume that all of it was this incredible allegory and that if you were smart enough, you could look at the text and you could see what the real message behind it was. And that's basically what Gnosticism is. Um, Gnosticism is just an incredibly elitist approach to religion that basically says um, that Christianity only exists for this very select few, um, which is kind of at odds with, you know, most of the gospels where Christ is saying, go speak to everybody. Um, and Manny is building on that tradition in the third century. He also picks up some bits from Judaism, some bits from the ancient Persian religion of Zoroastrianism, um, and probably some bits from Buddhism as well. Um, Buddhism and Buddhist thought um, had come into Iran with um, the silk trade routes. Um, anyway, so Manny basically looks at the world and in this sort of elitist way, he sort of just brushes away most of the Bible. He claims to be a prophet in line. Basically, he puts himself up as the equal of Jesus on the same line as Abraham and Moses, and he's going to give everybody the final interpretation. And he comes up with a system in which um, the world as we know it is the result of two forces that are always competing with each other, that there's a good force of light, um, and then there's an evil force of darkness. Um, and those two forces um, 
in the world as we know it are in constant um, battle with each other. And it's the job of this super secret special elite that are the Manichees to release the forces of light when they have been imprisoned in bodies. Um, and what it turns into is a small group that are known as the elect. Those are the ones who have fully accepted the religion. You could consider them to be sort of like Manichae monks. Um, and then there are the hearers. Um, and basically the elect don't do anything for themselves, um, but are supported by the hearers. Um, one of their ideas is that food itself is an example of the lightness of good creation that's trapped in the darkness of material reality. And so when one of the Manichae elects eats food, they're somehow able to release the light and the good part there that then gets to go back and join with the rest of the good and the bad part um, just stays in the body and is digested. The important thing for Augustine is that Manichaeism has a very simple solution um, to the question of good and evil. Um, that evil that Augustine was dealing with last time, that question of the pear tree, what made me do this? I just loved being bad. Um, the Manichees have a very simple solution for that. And that would be that what's causing him to do evil are the forces of dark evil materialism within him. Um, it's, the Manichee doctrine is it's kind of oddly reminiscent of Scientology. Um, with Scientology's ideas about Satans that are trapped in the body and have to be released. And you have this super of the people that are part of the cult, only a very small portion actually understand all of it. Um, and similar to Scientology, um, well, like all cults throughout history, um, it was highly attracted to, attractive to the elite. Um, we kind of have this idea that cults prey on the weak and the foolish, but that's simply not true. Um, basically, every cult that has ever existed um, has been a cult of elitist. If you've heard that phrase, something that's so absurd, only an intellectual could believe it. Um, that is the line that describes all cults throughout history. And Manichaeism is one of those. So for Augustine, as he's struggling with this question of evil, it's attractive to him because it provides a very simple solution. You're doing these things that you don't wanna do because there's this dark portion of creation that's within you. And if you hang around with us and you go through our rites, we'll show you how to separate the light from the darkness and then you can finally be released in all of this. Um, And later on, and you know, when he's writing, he's a Manichae for probably about 10 years, from about 376 to about 385. Um, he's a Manichae for most of that time. Um, and so when he's describing them later on, he's describing them as somebody who's gotten out of a group that promised a lot and was unable to deliver on that promise. So in reaction to this disappointment, um, paragraph 10, In reaction to this disappointment, I fell among a set of proud man, madmen, exceedingly carnal and talkative people in whose mouths were diabolical snares and a sticky mess compounded by mixing the syllables of your name and the names of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, who is our paraclete and consoler. Um, Manny himself claimed to be the paraclete. He claimed that he was actually uh, the Holy Spirit on earth. Those names were never far from their mouths, but amounted to no more than sound and the clacking of tongues, for their hearts were empty of truth. And this is the Augustine now who is looking back on this time in his life when he had just discovered the idea that there was truth out there and then came across this sect um, who claimed that he, they could deliver it. Oh, truth, truth, how the deepest and innermost marrow of my mind ached for you. Even then, while they prattled your name to me unremittingly and in so many ways, though only in words and in their huge copious tomes. Um, the Manichees had a huge um, set of scriptures. Um, and so they had a lot of words and Augustine was very impressed um, by their many words. But ultimately, um, this is something that is not going to be satisfying for him. Um, and we'll, come, we'll talk more about the Manichees next week because that ends up being a huge portion of book five. 
Um, and in retrospect here, he's able to say, the trouble was that I knew nothing else. I did not recognize the true other reality. Um, and this fantastic bit that we have here that goes, um, I'm sorry, so we're in chapter seven, um, paragraph 12. From here on 12, 13, and 14, he's going through how did he make the mistake of being brought in by these people? Um, and we have these fantastic, I did not know. I knew nothing else. I did not know that evil is nothing but the diminishment of good. Um, that is, there is not an active anti-God of evil who's opposing God at every force and equal to him, which is basically what Manichaeism says. Um, but evil is nothing. Evil is the diminishment of good because evil ultimately is a question of turning away from God, not towards anything else, but in the vain hope that you can make God unnecessary. Nor did I know that God is spirit. And this brings up the next major thing that we're going to see in the next book as well, the question of materialism, um, which is another fantastic lesson for our world today as secular American culture is um, completely materialist, not in the sense of um, looking for things to buy, although that too, um, but materialist in the sense that there's physical reality and that's all that exists. Um, the idea that there's a spiritual reality is one that Augustine has not had his eyes open towards yet um, because it's just not something that's been presented to him systematically in a way that he can appreciate. So he basically assumes that what he can sense is what exists. And it's not that he thinks there isn't a spiritual reality. It's that he's never even thought about a spiritual reality so he can't conceive that at this time. Nor did I know that God is spirit, not a being with limbs stretching far and wide and having a certain size. So the idea of God um, as immaterial, um, as beyond matter because God created matter, that's something that at this time Augustine can't even conceive. So the whole Manichae argument between light and dark um, is simply predicating on things the wrong way because even their God of light is material in a certain way. I did not know, paragraph 13, that true inward righteousness takes as its criterion, not custom, but the most righteous laws of Almighty God, by which the morality of countries and times was formed as appropriate to those countries and times, while God's law itself has remained unchanged everywhere and always. Um, a major question that the Manichees had for Augustine, where they attacked him in his Christianity, is they said, well, let's look at the Old Testament, and let's look at all of these things that these Old Testament patriarchs did. That you have people sacrificing children, you have people, you know, killing animals and having them as burnt offerings, uh, you have incest, you have adultery, you have all of these terrible things, then they, they ask Augustine, so how can you justify this? And Augustine can't really respond to that. Uh, and what Augustine comes up with later on is that what was righteous was not per se, in and of itself, um, the sacrificing of animals or any of the specific things that the people in the Old Testament did. What was righteous in their actions was obeying the command of God. Um, that God's commands have changed as human society has changed, um, but the criterion of righteousness is obeying the law of God. The criterion of righteousness is basically obedience, um, not the particular moral customs of the time. But he didn't know that. So when the Manichees asked him these questions about the Old Testament, he had no response for them. Um, and here, um, and this is a question that Augustine goes over at length, um, and he'll come back to this in City of God, the different things that you see in the Old Testament, um, some of the customs that by today's standards seem abhorrent, but the question ultimately is that of righteousness, and you judge it by obedience to God's will. Um, all this was beyond my comprehension at the time, and I made no allowance for it, and that's the major thing. Um, that Augustine has the usual problem of really smart youth. Um, I know I definitely had this. Um, that you know, you're 18, you know everything, and you refuse to acknowledge in humility that the fact that you don't have the answer might mean that the answer exists and you just don't know it, rather than there is no answer, and that's where Augustine is lost. In my blindness, I censured the holy patriarchs, um, that is, of the Old Testament, 
who not only made use of the opportunities available to them in the way ordained and inspired by God, but also prefigured what was to come as God revealed it to them. Um, we're going to come back to this idea later. It's the particular way of reading the Bible um, that's known as typology or figural interpretation. Um, and Augustine in these sections is just going, is continuing um, to go over this question of the behaviors in the Old Testament. You can see that these questions that the Manichees put to him were ones that he was still very much dealing with 10 years later, um, that he finally had the solution to how can you justify what happens in the Old Testament. And he wants to make sure that his readers today are able to defend it to themselves. Um, and then again, paragraph 18. I knew nothing of all of this, and so I derided your holy servants and prophets. Even as I laughed at them, I deserved to be laughed at by you, for gradually, little by little, I was being lured into such absurdities as the belief that a fig wept when plucked, and its mother tree too wept milky tears. Um, and so you have Augustine's wanting to say that the Old Testament, he can't understand it, so it must be absurd. But the Manichae beliefs that he's taking um, were that when you plucked fruit, um, similar to what some vegans hold today, um, you know, you're injuring that fig by plucking it and you're injuring the fig tree. So the Manichae elect, the holy men of the Manichae religion, weren't allowed to actually harvest any of their own food because that was harming plants. So the hearers, um, uh, who weren't on the same level, they had to go and do all of the sinful work, and then the elect would pray for them. Um, and then we come back to Monica, um, who is in tears at all of this. Previously, Augustine hadn't been accepting Christianity, but at least he hadn't abandoned it. At this point in time, he's abandoned it, and he's become a manichae, um, and it seems to her that he's lost. Um, so she receives visions, um, And she receives a vision that ultimately her tears will win out and Augustine will come back. Um, it's just going to take nine years. And then the, fin the final bit of this third book is as Monica is weeping for Augustine because it seems that his soul is lost to her. Um, he goes to a priest and she asks the priest, you know, talk to Augustine, rebut his, er rebut his errors, disabuse him of these persuasions, teach him the good ones. The priest, um, and we're in paragraph 21, he refused, however, and very wisely, as I subsequently understood, he replied that I was as yet unteachable. I was puffed up with the novelty of my heresy and had been tormenting plenty of unskilled persons with finicky little questions, as she told him. Leave him alone, he advised. Simply pray for him to the Lord. He will find out for himself through his reading how wrong these beliefs are and how profoundly irreverent. And of everything in Augustine's life, this is one of my favorite scenes where a Monica, Monica is doing everything she can to save him. And she goes to the priest and the priest gives her the advice that is the right advice. And this is exactly what happens in Augustine's life. Um, is that, you know, he reads and the Manichae religion is just utterly disappointing to him. Um, but the priest gives the advice that Monica needs to hear, but is so hard to hear. Pray for him to the Lord and trust in the Lord. Augustine will find out for himself. And the priest's final words after Monica entreats him, no, 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 you really have to talk to him. Go away now. But hold on to this, it is inconceivable that he should perish, a son of tears like yours. Um, Augustine's own torment that the priest saw very clearly, no matter how Augustine wanted to present himself. Um, the sign of that torment and that inner conflict was enough that the priest knew what Augustine ultimately would do. All right, so with that, um, we'll, at the end of book three, we'll take another break for questions and come back in a couple of minutes. Um, and there's a question to, 
from somebody who had joined late about how to follow. Um, so just again, the numbers that you're seeing up on the screen, the first number is the book number. The second number is the paragraph number. Um, so when you see here, um, there's two numbers. The smaller number here is the chapter number. Um, in the edition that you have, the chapter numbers are only put up um, at the beginning of the chapters. Um, and they're put um, center justified with a chapter title. Um, this larger number here is the paragraph numbers that you see with the text in that edition. Uh, no, so um, at this point, Augustine does the question is um, does Augustine say anything about his father's death? Um, no, not not yet. And with respect to the Manichees, one of the other reasons that Augustine seemed suspect to some people, um, the Roman authorities hated the Manichaeans as well um, because they their religion was a very secretive one. Um, Augustine only is able to tell us about it because he had been a part of it. Um, elitist, Gnostic sects of all kinds um, but the elitist sort of religions that make a huge difference between the elect and everybody else. Um, they're always secretive by their nature. And they usually tend to draw um, questions from whatever government is in charge. Um, and the Roman emperors repeatedly attacked the Manichees. Uh, the emperor Diocletian, um, you know, who had the, the great final persecution of the church. Um, also persecuted the Manichees. He ordered all of their books be burned um, and that the leadership of their church be burned at the stake as well. And so it's in 382, so only a few years before his conversion, that the Emperor Theodosian had officially banned Manichaeism um, throughout the entire empire. So for some Christians who were questioning Augustine's conversion, the fact that he had been a Manichae and then after they are officially banned, then he turns up as a Catholic, um, they found that suspicious. So another one of, there were a lot of reasons why Augustine wrote confessions. Um, and there was a lot of honest reasons for Catholics to be kind of suspicious of, was this a sincere conversion or not? All right, then we're going to move on to book four. Um, I mean, I was gonna say there's a lot in this book, but there's a lot in all of these books. So for the first part of this, um, some more of Augustine's um, reflections of his life as a manichae. Um, this is where he's going to uh, tell us about the concubine. Um, the woman that he took is basically a common law wife. Um, and then one of the most important moments in his young life is that of the death of a friend and how he deals with that. Um, the question of mercy, um, the theatrical mercy that he had for the stage actors before becomes real mercy, um, which is then going to lead us to a discussion of transience that all earthly things pass. So um, book four, paragraph one, throughout those nine years, from my 19th to my 28th year, I and others like me were seduced and seducers, deceived ourselves and deceived others amid a welter of desires, publicly through the arts reputed liberal, 
and secretly under the false name of religion. In the one we were arrogant, in the other superstitious, and in both futile. Um, so after Augustine goes through school, he gets hired to be a teacher of rhetoric. Um, and so to teach rhetoric is basically to you know, teach students how to make convincing arguments, whether or not those arguments are true. Um, so the arts reputed liberal um, and the liberal arts, um, where they get their name from, the Latin liber is the word for free. So the liberal arts were held to be those things that free men, that it's worth studying for free men, free men who have um, basically spare time on their hands and can make a living with their mind. In the Roman world, manual labor was absolutely despised. Um, in our society, we're definitely getting back to that today, um, but it's nowhere near as bad as it was in the Roman world. Uh, manual labors were held to simply be a different class of people. Um, that, and that's what the common people did. The common people worked with their hands um, and anybody of any birth whatsoever was supposed to work with their mind. Um, so the liberal arts, these are the things you studied if you didn't have to do manual labor and you found a way to make your living by selling words, basically, is what Augustine's going to tell us here. I mean, he's selling rhetorical skills. And what's really important here is that this comes right after that discussion that he had about reading Cicero and discovering truth and the idea of truth out there and real wisdom, wisdom that went beyond just making a convincing argument, um, but wisdom that was interested in, let's try to make a truthful argument. Let's make arguments that bring us to truth. Um, but here Augustine is, as in everything else in his life right now, fragmented. He wants to pursue wisdom on the other hand, but on this hand, he's using his skills to make a living by selling words. Um, and then secretly under the false name of religion, because again, um, the Manichae sect was banned. Um, it wasn't officially banned at this point in time, but they were regularly persecuted. Um, so they were a secret sect that, you know, Augustine's close friends would have known that he was a Manichae, but it's not something that would have been public knowledge. Let the haughty laugh at me, let them laugh who have never yet been flat on their face and felled for their own good by you, my God. But let me confess my disgraceful deeds to you and in confessing, praise you. So once again, Augustine's going to air, you know, the disappointing and for him embarrassing parts of his past, but to make an honest confession, an honest conversation with God. Um, and as much as Augustine is writing this um, sort of as a self-defense against those who would say that he wasn't sincere, above all, in every moment, and this we have to keep in mind as we read Confession, he's writing this to God. He's writing this as a conversation with God. Um, that's not just a rhetorical device that he's using. Um, sincerely, God is the intended audience of this book, um, and we are allowed to read along. Um, paragraph two, during these years, I was teaching the art of rhetoric, selling talkative skills apt to sway others because greed swayed me. Yet I preferred to have good pupils or such as passed for good, as you know, O oh Lord. And without any trickery on my part, I taught them the tricks of the trade. Never such as would secure the condemnation of the innocent, though sometimes such as were calculated to get the guilty acquitted. And you saw from afar, O oh God, how I was losing my foothold on slippery ground, but how amid the smoke, a spark of integrity still guttered in me. For though I taught students who loved worthless things and sought falsehood, exactly as he had been previously, in which pursuits I bore them company, I did try to teach them honestly. So that fragmented Augustine, the divided self, um, he has this desire for wisdom, but here he is making making a living the way he knows how, which is teaching people in a trade that very, very quickly goes into the dishonest. And he's trying to limit the dishonesty as much as possible. Um, at least I won't tell them how to condemn the innocent, even if sometimes the guilty go free. And that's the best that he can come up with at this time. And then he introduces the concubine. 
At this time too, I lived with a girl not bound to me in lawful wedlock, but sought out by the roving eye of reckless desire. All the same, she was the only girl I had and I was sexually faithful to her. This experience taught me at first hand what a difference there is between a marriage contracted for the purpose of founding a family and a relationship of love charged with carnal desire in which children may be born even against the parents' wishes. Though once they are born, one cannot help loving them. And so here, I mean, all of this tension, this paragraph that's, you know, written a decade after all of this has happened. Um, so he finds a girl that basically stops him at least um, from sleeping around. And he treats her with respect. He treats her, I mean, he remains faithful to her. She is, for all intents, a common law wife. Um, and the keeping of a concubine in Roman society was absolutely common. Um, it's something where people would have approved of him of doing this. But there would have been no question of condemnation. Um, the church at the time allowed this um, as long as, I mean, it's not like they were thrilled, um, but they would allow this under certain circumstances, particularly the way that Augustine is living with her here. Um, and what he learns from this, he learns at first hand what a difference there is between a marriage contracted for the purpose of founding a family, um, where that idea, the idea of procreation is there from the beginning and a relationship of carnal desire where they're actively avoiding pregnancy um, in which children may be born even against the parents' wishes. Um, but then that fails and a child is born. The once they are born, though once they are born, one cannot help but loving them. Um, and all of the evidence that we have is that his son, um, who he names Adeodatus, that is given by God, uh, he loved very much. Um, and although he and his common law wife were certainly not trying to have a family, um, they were definitely trying to avoid that and failed. Uh, contraception was very commonly practiced throughout the Roman world. Um, but once they had a family upon them, Augustine, again, remained faithful to her forever, and they loved that child very much. And then we have another, what can seem to be a weird switch, where Augustine goes back to rhetoric. Another thing I remember, and that question about, um, you know, how is Augustine putting this together, not from diaries, but just from his fragmented memory, basically. Um, and we see how his memory works here, where after introducing the concubine, after having talked about um, you know, rhetoric here, he talks about, again, this, this world of competition that he's in. Once when I decided to enter a dramatic poetry contest, some sorcerer fellow sent word to me to ask what I was prepared to pay him to ensure that I would win. Um, so now we get into another world that's going to go side by side with Augustine for a while, um, that of divination and magic. Um, the ancient world was filled with magicians. Um, and there were, some, there were some who honestly believed um, sort of like, like Dr. Faustus style. Like, yeah, there were some of those Dr. Faustus style who were willing to make packs with demons for knowledge. There were some who believed that they had learned so much about the secrets of nature that they could actually control it. Um, and there were some who were just grifters. Um, and that's what he's running into here is some guy who thinks he can make money off of Augustine because he knows that Augustine wants to um, be successful. And the easiest way to sell somebody something is to figure out what it is that they already want. Um, I replied that I detested and loathed those obscene rites and would not countenance the killing of a fly to bring me victory. And that's the manichae in him speaking there. Um, Even if the crown be won were of gold that would last forever, this fellow was prepared to offer living creatures in sacrifice. And I suspected that he intended by these rites to enlist demonic support for my cause. Um, and Augustine is the thinker that gives us the most clear condemnations of magic and necromancy. But it was not out of reverence for your purity that I rejected this evil thing, O God of my heart, 
for I had not yet learned to love you. All I had learned was to think about brilliant material objects. Um, Augustine, the materialist here who can't comprehend spiritual reality. Yet while I was refusing to have sacrifices offered to demons on my behalf, I was all the while offering myself in sacrifice to them through my superstition. For what does feeding the winds mean but feeding demons, providing pleasure and amusement for them by our errors? Um, so the lifestyle that Augustine's having here, um, he might detest the sorcerers, but he's recognizing that he's really not that far from them. Um, and then we have this little bit on astrology, which um, time's not really going to allow us um, to go over. Um, but astrology, you know, that was something else that's very common in the ancient worlds. And Augustine um, repeatedly condemns astrology and comes up with some of the best arguments um, for it. Um, this is the first time that he brings it in. But again, it's that knowledge, uh, that desire for knowledge about the future. Um, that desire for certainty when uncertainty is the human lot. And so um, paragraph five, we're gonna skip over this again, but this is one of the people that comes along in Augustine's life, um, um, a medical doctor. Um, who was a man of substance. Um, he wasn't a trained rhetorician like Augustine was. He wasn't just able to speak well, but he actually knew what he was talking about. Um, he had real wisdom. Um, I'd become quite well known to him and listened regularly and attentively to his speeches. For although unpolished in style, they were pleasant to the ear and weighty for the vigorous ideas that they expressed. Um, and for us, it might seem sort of like Obviously, you would care more about what somebody's saying rather than just their style. But in the ancient world, that's not it at all. The ancient world is one that is style alone. Um, and this person, who's another one of those steps along the way for Augustine, um, is one who encourages Augustine just to ignore all of the astrologers. And again, yeah, we, we just don't have time to go over that. Um, what's far more important here and sort of the heart of book four is the death of a friend at Thagest. At that same, same time period when I first began to teach in the town when I was born, I had a friend who shared my interests and was exceedingly dear to me. He was the same age as myself and like me now in the flower of young manhood. As a boy, he had grown up with me. We had gone to school and played together. He was not then such a friend to me as he was to become later, though even at the later time of which I speak, our union fell short of true friendship because friendship is genuine only when you bind fast people together who cleave to you through the charity poured abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Um, so for Augustine, only, only a love of God can allow for true friendship. Um, to love Want to love one, to love others as you love yourself requires first that you love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul. Um, so Augustine had pagan friendship. He had the love of virtue in another human being, um, but he doesn't have that highest beautiful kind of friendship yet. Um, but to the extent that he's capable of, um, it's the deepest friendship he's capable of at this time. I did love him very tenderly though. And the similarity of outlook lent warmth to our friendship. And what he's going to describe here is just the beauty, the height of what friendship can be um, when it's not based in Christ, when it's not based in a love of God above all. And it sounds very beautiful, but it leads to a problem. Um, and we're going to see that in a couple chapters here. So the young man gets sick. Um, he's on his deathbed. Um, and here, paragraph eight, as hope for his recovery dwindled, he was baptized without his knowledge. Um, Augustine the Manichae looks at this and certainly laughs. Um, and when his friend starts to recover, Augustine starts making fun of this. And he experiences something um, that he was not expecting. Um, 
that his friend, rather than rejecting this undesired, this unsought after baptism, um, actually criticizes Augustine for making fun of it. Um, so these moments, and this is what we have in these early books, are these little moments in Augustine's life where he has people playing a part in his pilgrimage back to God. But in the moment, it doesn't seem that earth shattering, but these individual experiences are all drawing Augustine to a very particular path. But although that friend seems to recover, he falls again sick and then he dies. And when he dies, Augustine's world is shook. Black grief closed over my heart, paragraph nine. And wherever I look, I saw only death. My native land was a torment to me and my father's house, unbelievable misery. Everything I had shared with my friend turned into hideous anguish without him. My eyes sought him everywhere, but he was missing. I hated all things because they held him not and could no more say to me, look, here he comes. I had become a great enigma to myself and I questioned my soul, demanding why it was sorrowful and why it so disquieted me, but it had no answer. If I bade it to trust in God, it rightly, that is his soul, disobeyed me. For the man it had held so dear and lost was more real and more lovable than the fantasy in which it was bidden to trust. Um, and so here we come, we're getting to the heart of the matter of to love another as yourself, but if you don't have a love of God above all. Um, and that the fragmentation of Augustine's soul here, again, and, and he, Augustine's going to pinpoint exactly what the issue is, but again, I become a great enigma to myself. Um, and even if he says trust in God to himself, the soul rebels because the soul recognizes that his love for this friend was far more real than the love that he has for God at this time. Um, weeping alone brought me solace and took my friend's place as the only comfort of my soul. All this is over now, Lord. And he's writing... 20, 20 years after these events, and my hurt has been assuaged with time. Let me listen now to you who are truth. Bring the ear of my heart close to your mouth, that you may tell me why weeping is a relief to the wretched. Can it be that although you are everywhere present, you have flung out wretchedness far away from you, abiding unmoved in yourself while we are tossed to and fro amid human trials? Surely not, for if we could not weep into your very ears, no shred of hope would be left to us. And this line is Augustine's low understanding of God, the idea of a God who is unmoved in himself, but detached from humanity. Um, the God of the philosophers, the watchmaker God who winds up the universe and then just lets it run, but is for which mankind has no emotional connection. Surely that can't be the case. If we could not weep into the ears of God, what hope would be left to us? And so Augustine is still tormented by all of this. And he comes into his misery. I was miserable and miserable too is everyone whose mind is chained by friendship with mortal things and is torn apart by their lost and then becomes aware of the misery that it was in even before it lost them. The question here is not having friends, um, but it's how do we love them? Miserable as I was, I held even this miserable life dearer than my friend. For although I might wish to change it, I would have been even less willing to lose it than I was to lose him. So even Augustine's misery has its limits here, but he's not going to throw away his own life because he's lost his friend. I believe um, still in paragraph 11, that the more I loved him, the more I hated death, which had taken him from me. I hated it as a hideous enemy and feared it and pictured it as ready to devour all human beings since it had been able to make away with him. Yes, this was my state of mind. I remember it. And what is the problem in all of this? He was dead whom I had loved as though he would never die. 
Augustine had loved something that is doomed to death as though it wouldn't die. To make another person your everything is to make them your God. Um, Augustine doesn't have a love of God that is central to his very existence. So the love that he has for other people tries to fill that void, but it can't. The love of the human heart is infinite. God made us with infinite desire that only he can fulfill. And so when Augustine tries to fill that desire through a human being, he is destined to be unsatisfied. He is destined to be heartbroken at this. That everyone that we love in life either will die and we will experience that, or we will die and they will experience our loss. That is the reality of life. Um, and no amount of pleasant thinking can change that. The only thing that can change that is to acknowledge a mortal being for what it is. Augustine isn't saying that he was wrong to love his friend. He was wrong to love his friend as the unique thing in the universe that was the fulfillment of all his hope and joy. He loved his friend the way that he should have loved God. And so we'll end this part with the prayer that he has at the end of 15, where he gets into this question of the transience of created things. Everything that is born will die. Um, and his definition of God, he alone loses no one dear to him to whom all are dear in the one who is never lost. So the person that loves God above all doesn't lose anyone dear to him because those are all saved in the Lord. Let my soul use these things to praise you, O God, creator of them all, but let it not be glued fast to them by sensual love, for they are going whither they were always destined to go toward extinction. They rend my soul with death-dealing desires, for it too longs to be and loves to rest in what it loves, but in them it finds no place to rest because they do not stand firm. They are transient, and who can follow them with the senses of the body, or who can seize them even near at hand? Tardy is carnal perception because it is carnal. Such is the law of nature. Sufficient it is for another purpose for which it was made, but insufficient to catch the fleeting things that rush past from their appointed beginning to their appointed end. In your word, through whom they are created, they hear your command. From here begin, and thus far you shall go. Okay, so uh, at this point we'll take another break between sections. Um, looks like we have a few questions um, in the chat. So um, were his parents okay with Augustine taking a concubine? Absolutely. Um, this was standard practice in the ancient world. Um, his father certainly would have been happy. It would have been a sign that Augustine is growing up. There's a child that his father could dote on who wanted grandchildren. Um, St. Monica loved Adeodatus dearly and Adeodatus loved Monica. Um, and again, it seems that Monica allowed, uh, invited the concubine into the home. Um, so, and something else that we have to remember at this point in time um, is that there was a huge difference um, between marriage was much more in control in the control of the secular world um, than we might assume it was. And so the secular habits towards marriage, um, the church worked with for the most part. Um, and so Augustine's parents would not have had an issue with this as long as, you know, the standards that Augustine followed, um, that he was faithful to her, that he respected her, that he loved her. Um, that being the case, there's no suggestion um, that his parents had any problem with this. Um, wasn't it significant that his friend asked him to stop ridiculing him because of baptism? Yeah. Um, and you know, if I wasn't clear on this, this is another one of those moments where Augustine is being put on the path towards truth, and then later he can recognize this. In the moment, um, it's not particularly important to him that the friend that Augustine would have expected to join in, oh, look at this absurd superstition, 
um, that that friend having the near-death experience um, is much is open to baptism um, in a way that Augustine simply isn't prepared to at that time. Um, didn't Manichaeism provide solace upon the death of his friend? Um, no. So what Augustine tells us here, um, we had to skip over that here. Um, is that he found, he found his consolation not in Manichaeism, um, but in his friends. Um, but again, it's that friendship that is limited because it's a friendship based solely on love of others and not based, not based on loving other human beings as children of God. And when you don't love another human being, whether it's a friend, whether it's a wife, whether it's a child, um, if you don't ground your love for them as, as a child of God, you love them for their relationship to you. Um, to love them independently is to love them as an equal child of God. Um, and that's a point that Augustine's going to come back to. Uh, I mentioned that the people of that day had no love for anyone. Um, I'm not sure exactly what I said, um, if I said they had no love for anyone. Um, the, I mean, the, the pagan Roman world did have love. Um, it's not a universal Christian love. Um, it's not the notion that you need to love people simply because they exist. Um, it's a very circumscribed love. It's an incredible incredibly conditional love above all. Um, but even the love that the Roman world has, and, and again, in the Roman world, um, the love that exists is mostly between men as friends, um, platonic friends. Um, it's not a sexual love, but the idea of love is that it's love of virtue in another human being. Um, the Roman idea of marriage had nothing to do with love whatsoever. It had to do with property rights for the most part. Um, did St. Augustine officially marry the woman that bore him a son? No, um, they were never officially married. Um, and there could be reasons for this. Um, and it has to do, again, that, that idea of Roman marriage um, as something sort of opportunistic. Uh, we'll read later that St. Monica does arrange a marriage for Augustine. It ends up being put off um, because the girl she found for him was not yet um, of the age of marriage, which was 13. So when St. Monica arranges a marriage for Augustine, it's an 11 year old girl. Um, she came from wealth. It would have been a family that had, had Augustine married her, he would have been able to pursue whatever he wanted to do in life without feeling that he had to make money as a teacher of rhetoric. Um, and he liked the girl. Um, again, it's hard to imagine though, the meeting between 30 year old Augustine, who is an imperial professor of rhetoric and an 11 year old girl about a proposed marriage. Um, that's that's the idea. That's marriage in the Roman world, something that's just completely unequal. Uh, there's he might have liked the girl, but there's just simply no way that a 30 year old man and 11 year old girl are ever going to have a marriage that's anything close to based on equality. Um, that's just completely unrealistic to expect, and it's not something that they expected. Um, whereas the concubine that Augustine has. Um, there is incredible respect there. He, I mean, he uses the word friendship to describe the relationship with her, which is something that in Roman pagan terms, it's sort of a category error, um, saying that you can be friends with um, 
a woman. That's not something that works in um, Roman pagan society. Um, so why doesn't he marry her? Because she had started off as his concubine, that in itself basically disqualified her from marriage. Um, it's possible that she had been a slave. Um, there's, he doesn't say much about her, um, which some editors have seen as being Augustine sort of being dismissive toward her, but it's Augustine's genuine love for her that he doesn't name her. Um, because since they were the same age, we can assume that she was still living in North Africa when Augustine was made priest and then bishop. Um, so for Augustine to have named her in this work while she was still alive, um, quite possibly would not have reflected well on her. Um, the love that he bore for her was very real. Um, the society in which he lived didn't basically allow for um, an expression of that love that would go into marriage. Okay, and with that, let's go on for our last section. Why did they split? Um, last question that we have there. Um, when St. Monica brought in the prospective wife at that point in time, um, it became inappropriate for Augustine to continue to have a concubine. And so she was sent back to Africa. Um, and the parting, we'll read about, Augustine describes their parting. Um, and you can tell he's, he's still moved by it 10 years after the fact when he's writing confessions. Um, and the woman vows that she vows herself to chastity for the rest of her life that she will never take another man. All right. So the last section that we're looking at today um, is Augustine's attempt again at sort of making sense of this, this fragmented self that he has. Um, he's dealing with the suffering, the death, the loss of a friend, um, the friend whose loss is all the more severe because he loved that friend inappropriately, um, not in the sense that he shouldn't love a friend, but in the sense that he loved his friend as though his friend would always be there, which is just not within the nature of human, human beings. Um, so he turns to that the way that he does um, with what we might call intellectual subterfuge um, and it doesn't work. So we get to see Augustine's attempts at overcoming these problems through his intellect and another failure. So confessions for paragraph 16, be not vain, my soul, and take care that the ear of your heart be not deafened by the din of your vanity. You too must listen to the selfsame word who calls you back, and there find a place of imperturbable quiet where love is never forsaken unless it chooses to forsake. So after all of the turbulence of the first part of the book, um, the second part here, we begin with this, you know, calling the soul to quiet, calling the soul to be recalled to God that calls it back where there is that quiet and where love is never forsaken unless it chooses to forsake. And of course, this is the problem that Augustine is in at this time um, is that he doesn't know God. Um, though he's called back, he forsakes that largely through his own arrogance. And that's what we're going to see in this section. And so Augustine is on this path of having this notion of truth, what he had discovered in Cicero, wanting to find that. Um, he's suffering after the loss of a friend. And so he comes to this idea of beauty. Um, and he's going to want to try to take beauty beyond just carnal pleasure, but beauty as sort of an ideal. Um, the problem with having beauty as an ideal is that he's a materialist. Um, the idea that, um, you know, the three transcendentals, um, truth, beauty, and goodness. 
Uh, there are no transcendentals if you're a materialist, if all that you believe in is what you can experience with your senses. There is no transcendent ideal of beauty. Um, so how are you going to go about trying to talk about that? Um, and that's the, the nature of Augustine's problem in this particular section. Um, his reflection on this afterward, if sensuous beauty delights you, praise God for the beauty of corporeal things and channel the love you feel for them onto their maker, lest the things that please you lead you to displease him, which essentially is what he did with his friendship that he lost. Um, that doesn't lead him towards any relationship with God. And love for Augustine is always about relations. Um, his relation with God at this time is almost non-existent. If kinship with other souls appeals to you, let them be loved in God, because they too are changeable and gain stability only when fixed in him. Otherwise, they would go their way and be lost. And that question of stability, um, the mad rush that is Augustine's life, um, and exactly what he went through. If kinship with other souls appear to you, let them be loved in God, because only in God can there be stability. Without that, they go on their way and they're lost, which is exactly what he experienced. Let them be loved in him and carry off to God as many of them as possible with you and say to them, and then he has this long bit that should be said that we can't go over um, simply due to time constraints here. But after he goes through this great discourse, this is what you must tell them to move them to tears in this valley of weeping. And by this means, carry them off with you to God. How do you bring, how do you bring souls to God? Because if you burn with the fire of charity, as you speak, you will be saying these things to them by his spirit. Um, and where he talks about true friendship, the only true friendship that you can have where you love somebody as a child of God is a, is a friendship that it burns in the love of the Holy Spirit. However, and we go back to what he had in the last book, I did not know, being ignorant of all this at the time and in love with beautiful things below me, I was plunging into the depths. To my friends, I would say, do we love anything save what is beautiful? And what is beautiful then? Indeed, what is beauty? What is it that entices us and attracts us in the things we love? Surely if beauty and loveliness of form were not present in them, they could not possibly appeal to us. And it sounds like an odd thing for Augustine to say to a friend, this sort of high fluting language, but that's the language of the rhetorician. Um, this is what Augustine is um, doing with his life is using words for a purpose. So he applies his mind to these questions, and it struck me that in material objects, there is both a quality inherent in the whole, beauty, and a different quality that was seemingly in something that was harmoniously adapted to something else, as part of the body to the whole, or a sandal to the foot, and other similar things. This realization welled up in my mind from my innermost heart, and I wrote some books entitled The Beautiful and the Harmonious. Two or three books, I think, you know, oh God, but it escapes me, for I no longer have them. They somehow have been lost. Um, so the young, arrogant Augustine takes his ideas um, and wants to write a great treatise on the beautiful and the harmonious. Um, he loses these books, um, which we can assume was intentional. Um, had he found anything particular of value, somebody like Augustine absolutely would have held on to these books. My guess would be that by the time he's writing Confessions, um, his work on beauty that he had written while he was a manichae was somewhat embarrassing to him. Um, and then, and this is that tension that we, all, that we still have in these early books with Augustine. He's wanting to go after beauty and truth, but he's still in that Roman world of competition of rhetoric, of using words for advancement. <clears throat> and so he writes a book that could be philosophy, but he writes it for a very non-philosophical purpose here. What was it, O oh Lord, that prompted me to dedicate those books to an order in Rome, Hierius? So this great order in Rome, but Augustine says, I did not know him personally, but I'd come to esteem him for his splendid reputation for learning. I'd also heard him quoted and liked what I had heard. But what I liked still better was the fact that he found favor with 
others. People who extolled him highly and marveled that Assyrian, previously formed in Greek eloquence, had reached such eminence as a Latin orator and was at the same time so exceedingly learned in philosophical matters. So Augustine writes something that's supposed to be the search for truth, um, but he dedicates it to somebody he doesn't know at all. He only knows of their reputation. Um, he's read a few things and he seems to like that, but what he really likes about this person is that this person's famous. And Augustine wants to attach himself to a famous person in Rome. And the fact that he's sending it to somebody in Rome shows that his ambition is burning and he wants to get out of Carthage. Um, he wants to continue to climb that social ladder. So he has a, a search for truth on the one hand, um, but everything that has been beaten into him, that careerism is still very much there. He wants to attach himself to the famous people of Rome, hopefully, um, almost certainly, to get an invitation to teach rhetoric in Rome himself. At that time, I admired people simply because they were judged praiseworthy by others, not on the strength of any judgment of yours, oh my God, by which no one is deceived. All the same, why was the esteem in which I held Hierius not like that evoked, say, by some noble charioteer or a gladiator made widely famous by popular enthusiasm? but something far different, more serious, and akin to the commendation I hoped to win myself. And this is the thing here. It's not just that he's famous, um, because actors, charioteers, gladiators, they can be famous. Um, however, in the Roman world, all of these people, it didn't matter how famous a charioteer or a gladiator was, they were, I mean, the gladiators were slaves themselves. Um, the charioteers were quite often slaves. Sometimes they were freedmen, but they were viewed as like one step above slaves. Um, that whole world of the poor people work with their hands and the good people work with their minds. Um, that goes into a social hierarchy that um, is hard for us to imagine the way that we do fame today. Um, but in the Roman world, there was slaves, prostitutes, gladiators, actors, charioteers slash athletes. Those were people who could be very famous on their own, but you would, ne you would never allow them like into your house. Um, they were people that you would not um, associate with socially because they were so far beneath you. So Augustine is going even further in his love of Hierius's fame, that it's not just the fame and celebrity, but it's the kind of fame that he wants for himself. He wants to attach himself to somebody. He wants to ride the coattails and become that person himself. I had no wish to be celebrated and loved in the way actors are, even though I myself celebrated and loved them. I would have preferred obscurity to notoriety like theirs. How can these, be contra how can these contrasted and warring loves be carried in a single soul and balanced against each other? How can Augustine love seeing an actor's performance and love the actor when he would hate to actually have to be an actor? And And it's a question that Augustine has such a hard time dealing with. Um, and it, it's a little deeper question than what it appears on its surface. Um, how can you admire the fame of those people that you would be completely embarrassed to actually have to be yourself? This orator, however, paragraph 23, was the sort of man I loved in the sense of wanting to be like him. I was driven off course by my pride and tossed about by every wind for your guidance of me was very unobtrusive. How do I know, how can I confess to you with certainty on um, paragraph 23, that I had come to love him more for the love he aroused in those who sang his praises than for the achievements by which he won them. I know it because if instead of praising him, those same people had recounted his deeds with disparagement and contempt, I would not have warmed to him or felt any interest. Yet neither the facts nor the man himself would have been different. And so that question of substance that was brought up in his reading of Cicero, it's starting to be applied here, um, that Augustine loves somebody for dumb reasons um, or for superficial reasons. But Augustine here is at least able to recognize the superficiality of it, um, that he loved this person, not so much for what he said, but for how his words were received by people. And Augustine sends off this 
book to the orator, hoping that this orator will love it. And then, and this is just so delightful for the arrogant uh, man in his young 20s. I considered it with a contemplative eye and admired it. That is the book, although no one shared my appreciation. So Augustine's nice way of telling us that his book uh, was not judged as well. And the problem that he's having, not so much the problem that he has there with um, his desire to be received well, but the, the substantial problem that he has. I did not yet see that the whole vast question that is of beauty hinged on your artistry, almighty God. My mind scanned material forms, that is concrete objects that we can see. And I defined and distinguished what was beautiful in itself from what was harmonious because fittingly adapted to something else, supporting my distinction with material examples. I turned to the nature of the soul, but here I was balked by the famous, the false opinion which I held concerning spiritual entities and unable to discern the truth. Truth was thrusting itself upon me, staring me in the face, but I averted my trembling thought from incorporeal reality and looked instead towards shapes and colors and distended mass. And since in the soul, I could not see these, I concluded I was not able to see the soul. You know, the problem of you know, the modern scientific viewpoint, there's nothing wrong with science, um, but science is a, a process of you know, material rationalism. Um, that doesn't, the suggestion that there is not something beyond the material just because you're not looking for it is kind of absurd. And so this is where Augustine is, is he doesn't have a conception of what could be immaterial. Um, so he discards all of that. And we have those words that are so Augustinian here, fragmentation and disintegration as he's trying to describe what is beautiful in these material objects, unity, some kind of unity is what is above all the most beautiful um, and fragmentation is ugly. Ugly in a ethical sense, but also ugly in the aesthetic sense. Um, The problem in all of this is the young, arrogant Augustine instead, and he's talking about this issue that he cannot solve here, trying to understand beauty that goes beyond just these single objects, but not having anything immaterial, those transcendence. How do you discuss beauty without having a concept of transcendent beauty itself? Um, and Augustine's trying to work this out in his own mind. Instead, I was striving to reach you by my own efforts. And you thrust me away to taste death because you thwart the proud. What could be prouder than my outlandish delusion whereby I laid claim to be by nature what you are? I was subject to change as was obvious to me from the fact that I was clearly seeking to be wise in order to change for the better. Yet I was prepared even to think you changeable rather than admit that I was not what you are. I conjured up material forms in my imagination and I who was flesh disparaged the flesh for I was a roving spirit that had not yet returned to you. I was readier to assert that your immutable, immutable substance had been forced into error than to confess my own mutable substance had gone astray by its own will and that its error was its punishment. Um, so what does he mean when I lay claim to be by nature what you are? He's claiming to have the judgment of God. Um, he's claiming to be able to discern and to define beauty and to determine what actually the world is. Um, and as always for Augustine, sin by its nature is a turning away from God, but it's a turning away from God in the idea that we can find that ultimate happiness in something else. Um, Augustine is searching for a way to describe the beautiful without going to the author of beauty. And rather than admit that he's simply wrong, he persists in this error.
And then the last section of this book and today's lecture, um, Aristotle's categories. When I was about 20, a certain writing of Aristotle had been put into my hands entitled The Ten Categories. What a proud mouthful it was when my rhetoric master at Carthage and others reputedly learned rattled off the list of them. And here we have a sense of learning as the ability to appear really smart um, without having any substance behind it. Um, so the categories is a basic logical work of Aristotle, um, how you divide up the world in a way that you can, how you define up things that exist so that you can discuss them intelligently. Um, and so Aristotle comes up with 10 ways of describing the world, and those are each of the categories. Aristotle is incredibly difficult to read. Um, if you've ever had to read him, um, he's very difficult to read because he didn't actually write any books. Everything that we have from Aristotle um, is assumed to be some combination of lecture notes and student notes. Um, so his, what he's saying is incredibly condensed um, and it's not always clear. Um, and one of the great moments as a student of Aristotle is when you realize that nobody really understands Aristotle either because you spend the first few months, sometimes years, I'm convinced that you're just not understanding something that other people all seem to understand because it should be clear. Um, and then you start reading what other people say about Aristotle and you realize none of them can agree on what he's literally saying. Um, and Augustine basically has this experience here um, that they go through the categories and Augustine reads them off and he feels like he has a good sense of it. And as far as Aristotle's stuff goes, categories isn't um, insane and difficult. Um, there's some parts where it's not clear exactly what he means, but for the most part, um, you can make some sense of it. Um, but what's important here is that as Augustine's going through this, he's recognizing that his rhetoric master and the fellow students don't understand Augustine, or they don't understand Aristotle at all. Um, when I compared notes with other students who admitted they scarcely understood the categories from the most expert masters, masters who gave not only oral instruction, but even diagrams in the dust, I found that they were unable to tell me anything that I had not already grasped from my private meeting, reading. Um, so Augustine's able to go through all of this. And then he goes on to talk about um, the entire set of the liberal arts. What I understood about grammar, rhetoric, dialectic, or logic, geometry, music, arithmetic, Without much difficulty or tuition from anyone, I understood because my swift intelligence and keen wits were your gift. What he's recognizing here, um, and this is education in the late Roman Empire, is that it's fallen to such a state. Um, what passed for mathematical and geometrical education in the fourth century was nothing close to what it had been in Greece during classical times. Um, and Augustine's just acknowledging here that these masters, and this is really important, even the masters who claim to know these texts don't really understand what they're talking about, and that Augustine on his own is able to understand them just as well as these masters of rhetoric who present themselves um, as these brilliant minds. So another one of the steps along the way in Augustine's journey here is these people who, these masters of rhetoric who he had idolized before. Um, he's now in a position, I mean, and he says this is only when he's 20 years old that he reads categories, um, that even at the age of 20, he's in a position to finally realize that maybe his adulation of this profession is misplaced, um, that this world of these supposed brilliant people, they're not actually that brilliant. Um, and he's able to do that basically because he's able to read something on his own and understand it. And then he's able to rest that, recognize that everybody who's talking about it um, is kind of just talking in circles. They don't really understand it, but they are citing from it in a way to impress others. Um, and that's a lesson that's gonna take us into next week's reading when Augustine starts to have issues with Manichae doctrine and is unable to find anybody who can answer those questions for him. Um, so I'll take questions after this, but we'll leave on the prayer with which Augustine ends this book. O Lord, our God, grant us to trust in your overshadowing wings. Protect us beneath them and bear us up. You will carry us as little children, and even to our gray-headed age, you will carry us still. When you 
are our strong security, that is strength indeed. But when our security is in ourselves, that is but weakness. Our good abides, you, abides ever in your keeping. But in diverting our steps from you, we have grown perverse. Let us turn back to you at last, Lord, that we be not overturned. Unspoiled, our good abides with you. For you are yourself our, for you yourself are, you are yourself our good. We need not fear to find no home again because we have fallen away from it. While we are absent, our home falls not to ruins, for our home is your eternity. Okay, um, and with that, uh, we'll deal with questions. If there are any. And if there are not any questions, um, was Augustine writing this for a public audience? Um, yeah, so Augustine, I mean, he's being very sincere in the fact that Confessions is written as a conversation between him and God. Um, however, he clearly intended this to be published um, uh, in the way that books are published in the Roman world. Um, that you hire a couple of people to be copyists and you sent you do you can do public readings of them. I don't know. Augustine probably would not have done public readings of confessions, um, but he would have sent confessions to people with the understanding that they would read it, but also that with the understanding that they would have copies of it read. Um, so yeah, it's it is sincerely intended as a conversation with God, but it's likewise is intended from the very beginning. Um, as something that's going to be read by the public. All right, um, if there's nothing else, thank you very much for being here. I look forward to next week where we'll be reading Confessions 5 and 6, and I will get this uploaded and send along the link probably tomorrow morning. So have a good weekend or have a good week, I guess it's Monday <laughs> um, and I'll see you next week.